Thank you, Dr. Shar, for that kind introduction. Um, before I go to my presentation, let me start the discussion with a poll question, just to um, get our viewers to warm up to our topic today. So the poll question is being shown on the screen. And to respond, kindly go to the link um, shown um, in the chat box. So the, the question is, what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase migrant workers? So um, you have 10 seconds to send in your inputs. Um, I think uh, you, you can provide maximum of three words. And um, there are no right or wrong answers here. So we just want to, to know your thoughts. So I think um, 10 seconds will be just about now. OK. So, okay, so um, the largest word um, in the word cloud is OFW, and the others are hard work and, okay, there's also remittance, sacrifice. I think this is, this is, um, the responses are coming, coming in, so, babago yung. So, okay, the, the largest words are now FW and remittance. I think that's that's very interesting and um i think yeah so sacrifice is also showing up as one of the the key terms so thank you very much for for um those inputs um for your active uh, participation um it, it shows how how uh filipinos um really view and i myself i think when i when i hear the word migrant workers i would think first about sacrifice. Okay, so let me now go to the presentation. I'd like to first acknowledge my, my um, co-authors, uh, Ms. Rita Vargas and Ms. Madeline Baini for their excellent um, excellent uh, assistance in, in terms of producing this uh, paper and in doing the, the analysis. So our study is uh, really about documenting the Philippines government's COVID-19 um, support mechanism. So sorry, I, I'd, I'd just like to, to correct the, the term that we use. It should be COVID-19, not post-COVID-19, because a lot of the a lot of the assistance, the support were provided um, during really the pandemic. So um, please note that when when uh, when we say support mechanism, we have given the the aspect of repatriation a greater emphasis um, rather than the the implementation, for instance, of reintegration programs, um, which I think merits a separate study. And we did this. Um, we chose this focus because um, I felt that the task of repatriation was so great during those times, and I think it. This warrants um, a documentation, especially the lessons that we have learned from it. So, next slide, please. Okay, so let me just. Uh, this is the outline of the study. So, basically, the 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 discussion will uh, revolve around the background. The background being just the overview of impacts of the COVID nineteen to our uh, migrant workers and also um, um, overseas Filipinos. And then I'll go very quickly very quickly lang on the on the covid-19 support system and i mean um and i mean uh, when when i say support system it's actually the policy framework um that supports the the operations the the processes that we we did um and then i'll move and uh, and focus more on the discussion about the crisis management um meaning the the processes of repatriation um and then the strategies of communication and then we we look at the uh, various lessons that we have learned. And so from, from, from these, um, I try to synthesize uh, by looking at the, the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so uh, what are the impacts of the pandemic to overseas Filipinos? Well, um, we can categorize them um, um, using this, uh, these categories. So, well, uh, the economic impact, uh, we, we've seen that, and uh, there were ma massive job losses, lower income reductions, or, or lower pay um, because of how the COVID-19 affected many businesses around the world. And of, uh, OFWs have exhausted their, their savings. Um, of course, uh, 
COVID-19 is a um, is a health emergency was a health emergency of of um incomparable scale so what are the the direct impacts these are deaths sickness um isolation we saw reports of stress and anxiety and also mental um issues and then of course there were also challenges uh, associated with the processes of relief um repatriation return and reintegration and we will look into this um we will discuss this in more details um later on next slide please for us to get a better view of how big the numbers were in terms of the arrivals, which the government um, and its partners had to manage during the time, these are the data of the OFW returnees. So, hindi pa kasama dito yung non-OFW. So, as of August, um, end of August 2022, uh, when we were doing this study, 2.3 million OFWs returned. And that um, that uh, comprises of the land-based workers and the sea-based workers. If you look at the end of 2020, when things were intense, it was around 600,000 um, of them plus uh, 129,000 um, non-OFWs. On the right panel, you can um, right panel of the slide, uh, we can see how the remittances went on a dive during the early part of 2020, although we can see how fast it recovered. And I think it it uh, now um, it is now at levels um, that is comparable uh, to the pre-pandemic uh, period. Although I think the deployment has not uh, gone back to pre-pandemic uh, period still. Um, next slide, please. Um, Okay, so the government has also implemented implemented a massive uh, Balik Provincia program. The Balik Provincia is is um, the program that um, that helped or facilitated the return of of um, overseas Filipinos to their to their residences. So as of August um, end of August twenty twenty two, over one million. Um, return, returning overseas Filipinos benefited from the Balik Provincia program. 50% of them traveled by air, 40 by land, and 9% by, by sea. If you look at the monthly data, uh, the bottom uh, left the graph, we can see how um, a large portion of these were, were assisted in 2020 and in 2021. And uh, the numbers became smaller as we as we opened up uh, our economy in 2022. So, mas sila. Um, in terms of the confirmed cases of COVID-19 infection, as of end August 2022, there were 33,500 returning overseas Filipinos who contracted the disease, who contracted the disease with 99.7 recovery rate. In terms of deaths among returning overseas Filipinos um, during the same period, uh, that is uh, end of August 2022, um, 7,577 um, returning, uh, returning overseas Filipinos have died uh, from the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what do we know about the returnees? So in terms of origin of returnees, um, the DFA repatriation data showed, uh, although this is in 2020, um, it shows that an overwhelming majority came from the Middle East which is the top destination of our workers. And I think that's um, that's um, uh, an expected um, outcome. Um, now, um, we also looked into a study that was conducted by IOM sometime in 2020. And uh, that study showed that not all of the returnees came home due to the virus. So, But majority or 67% came home due to the pandemic. And you can see here that um, a bulk of them or the majority of them uh, are relatively young. That's uh, their age between 25 to, to 39. And uh, that um, an overwhelming proportion, 83% remain unemployed three months um, post arrival. Next slide, please. So given these, um, given these um, effects, uh, what we wanted to, uh, to do in, in our study was really to to document and examine the, the support mechanisms implemented in the Philippines. And in the paper, we identified um, interventions or, or support uh, provided by, by the government um, to our overseas Filipino workers. And um, we focused on also on the, the key processes and mechanisms of operation and coordination among various entities um, from, from the government and also non-government um, bodies because they also played um, quite a, a significant role. And what we really wanted also 
to is to really um, discuss the challenges or, or extract the challenges so that we can um, we can um, draw lessons from them. So in the end uh, of this presentation, what, what we really want to come up with uh, are the lessons that we need to learn from this pandemic. Next slide, please. So just to show you a, a brief, um, a brief, uh, um, briefly our conceptual framework, we uh, we are using one that comes from the literature of crisis management through the leadership lens, and so we are looking at these dimensions. I think it, it was this was useful for us to to know which aspects to to use from I to use uh, in terms of this um, this analysis, and. Um, we did not have information for all the stages that you can see here in terms of the say preparedness, early recognition and sense making, making critical decisions, um, looking at coordination. Um, but we just uh, looked, uh, we, we just obtained um, those uh, that where we can get information in terms of these categories. So in terms of data sources, naman, we use mainly administrative data from, from various sources. And we, we also did some uh, key informant interviews with um, um, with our partners in the government, those who, who really who were frontline um, workers in the, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll go through the policy framework um, very fast because um, this has lots of information. But I just have, I think, a thirty ten minutes to 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 discuss the rest of the presentation. So, um, but basically what we want to show here is that prior to the pandemic, the, the Philippines policy framework that governs its um, its responses to crisis situation has been um, informed by our experience in the past. And I think it's, it's important because this indicates quite a lot of learning in the labor migration governance aspects. Next slide, please. So, for instance, following the Gulf War, um, where we had to repatriate 30,000 Filipinos um, uh, from, from Kuwait during that time, the government came up with, with these policies afterwards. So, for instance, the Assistance to Nationals Task Force, the Country Team Approach. Uh, we also uh, came up with our um, with RA8042, uh, which is the, the, the key policy for, for protection of our migrant workers. And then um, we also came up with the Crisis Management and Security Manual for um, overseas Filipinos. Next slide, please. Following the Israel-Lebanon conflict, where we also had to repatriate uh, thousands of Filipinos, we had uh, our RA10022, which is the which is the amendment uh, amending the the RA8042, and then following the Arab Spring, we came up with these policies, um, including, uh, for, in, for instance, the Joint Manual of Operations, and then the the IMRA, the Interagency uh, Medical Repatriation Assistance Program for Overseas Filipinos. Next slide, please. We have also um, clearly identified uh, our plans, how to go about it um, in terms of preparation, the, the repatriation during the crisis and then post repatriation. We've also clearly identified the teams and, and also their roles. Next slide, please. And we have um, clear mechanisms in place in, in the event of a crisis as, as shown by, the, by this um, uh, country team approach and its elements. Next slide, please. Of course, you, you may be you may be familiar already with the different um, OWA programs um, meant for assisting affected migrant workers. Um, we have social benefits, we have educational training, of course, repatriation is there, and we also have um, uh, reintegration programs. Next slide, please. So the policies um, that have been mentioned, um, they have been set, you know, prior to, to the pandemic, which helped a lot um, in the preparation of the country in addressing the, the effects of the pandemic on, um, on the overseas Filipinos, uh, Filipino workers. Now let's move to the processes in addressing the effects of, of the pandemic. So in response, um, to the events in early 2020, the following directives uh, advisories have been promulgated, and this this is the timeline of those directives. So we have here um, the voluntary repatriation from China in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are we are also familiar with the the declaration of the state of of public health emergency, and we also have quite a lot of 
um, uh, directives here from, from DOLE, from P POEA, from TFA, and even from the Office of the, the President. Next slide, please. In terms of how the quarantine operations were implemented or the repatriation um, processes, this graph came from the OWA and um, it's very uh, useful in showing the different stages, you know, from airport assistance uh, to quarantine monitoring and accommodation, and lastly, to transportation, transportation going to their, uh, to the OFWs and overseas Filipinos residences. Next slide, please. Okay, so the graph that was uh, shown earlier was quite simple, but if we zoom in, it, it's actually like this. So it's it's more complicated. You can see um, there are nine steps here from health check to mandatory quarantine briefing to um, booking of, of a quarantine facility, and then check ups, uh, also in then transportation. So um, there are quite a lot of steps. Next slide, please. That one is for land base, and the, the next slide will show the, the process for seafarers, this one. And I think this is the, the one-step shop for arriving seafarers going to, uh, I think, Visayas and, and Mindanao. So you can also see here. You can see the steps, and you can see the agency responsible um, for, for, the, for these uh, different um, aspects or steps. Next slide, please. So to just to just to sort of validate the the processes that have been um that have been published um in, in our government um, agencies uh, websites. So we also um, talk to uh, to OFWs who returned and um and true enough, these are the it, it's 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 uh, quite the same um, as the as the flowchart that was shown earlier. It's just that there are also uh, interesting um, items here, like, like for instance, um, there were group chats uh, when 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 they when they are uh, put in quarantine accommodation, they have um, they have group chats that make uh, communication easier, um, and the 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 health checks they happen quite um, um, a lot of a lot of of. Uh, health checks here you have health checks uh, dun sa number two and then health checks sa eight when they arrive at their at their um facility facility ground and then there are also um swab tests uh, what when they're already uh, in the quarantine hotel of course this may differ depending on the the schedule of their arrivals because we had we had different protocols um um at different times uh, during that time next slide please I just want to show also the the returning overseas Filipinos by points of entry. So we can see here that three fourths came in via Dinaia terminals, our main uh, our main uh, points of entry, and I think it's it's useful for us to, to have this um, and to to inform, um, for instance, our. Um, our policies and our uh, programs were in. It, it's important that other points of entry uh, be capacitated in the future so that we wouldn't be, the, the main points of entry would be too uh, overcrowded. And then this overcrowding uh, can lead to um, other uh, problems uh, as well. Um, next slide, please. I'd also like to show you that um, most of the testing um, uh, were done by uh, trained personnel of the Philippine Coast Guards in our airports, although there are also other partners who, who did some of the tests. Next slide, please. Just to show you, uh, this is the six-day swabbing operation, and again, it's the PCG that did most of the testing. Next slide, please. So there were different... Um, Swabbing operations, so my my six day, my seven day. Again, this depends on the the, the protocols that we've had, and they were changing during that time. Next slide, please. In here, um, we show you the programs that have been implemented um, to assist OFWs on site um, in repatriation and in recovery, and also in their return to their provinces, and also in terms of reintegration. Next slide, please. And then this table shows the beneficiaries. So um, what we can see here is that um, while there are many OFWs who have returned, 
there are very negligible um, numbers uh, that benefited from the other programs. So yung pinaka-popular is the, the Dole Akap, um, the Abot Kamay Ang Pagtulong program, um, the financial, the one-time financial assistance. And I think it's important to also look to analyze um, what have been the challenges associated with uh, participation in the other other programs. Uh, because if, if you see here, although this one is end of 2021, yung latest kasi. So I think it's it's important that we also look um, into whether there are constraints in in uh, participating kasi medyo mababa yung, yung uptake ng other programs. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of financial resources utilized for COVID-19 response, um, the DOLE and the OWA um, have incurred a total of 19 billion, uh, but uh, we are checking the, the timeline of this um, because uh, based on the 2020 data for the OWA alone, um, based on their annual report, um, the OWA spent 13.3 uh, billion um, for 2020 fiscal year. So um, it would be important for us to get the the entirety of the the financial resources that has uh, that have been utilized and that that um helps us in like in our, our future sort of uh, policy uh, for uh, formulation of programs and uh, para like ganito pala kadami o kalaki yung kailangan mo if if ever we are in the same situation in the future sanan din naman so so yeah i think we need to improve or update uh, this uh, particular data next slide please now we move to um, communication. Uh, this is uh, one of the aspects wherein we got um, some information. Um, what we did here is that we we uh, look at we kumbaga, we came up with our typology for purposes of analysis. So we looked at um, intergovernmental coordination. We also looked at uh, communication, government to people communication, and then people to government communication and government to other organizations. So for intra uh, governmental coordination these are the strategies that were implemented we have the the uh the one country uh, approach for on-site coordination and then we also have regular communication between on-site and home offices and um there uh, also, there is also a multi um agency initiative for a task force um has been formed i think this is under the umbrella of the broader umbrella of the the iatf next slide please and those were frameworks for for communication in terms of government to people the strategies cited were the use of technology in closing information gaps um I think there's a best practice uh, here, which is the, the OFW Assistance Information System um, or OASIS at DOLE. And they were, it was uh, crucial in managing the various processes of repatriation, um, testing, quarantine, and transport. Um, information uh, dissemination is also done using uh, online websites and social media for, for the government to communicate um, to the 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 people the constituents next slide please in terms of um government this is a continuation of government to people so um communication is also done through house parents as i've mentioned earlier in quarantine facilities so since the protocols change quite frequently so there was a need for close communication to to disseminate the changes in terms of the protocol. So in quarantine facilities, they have what they call house parents. Um, these are, are representatives of OWA. Um, and they are the ones uh, managing the the the, um, the affairs of the OFWs in the quarantine facilities. We, there is also this um this online forum called UIANA, um, and they were uh, useful in terms of, of communicating to, to the people. I think the the role of the, the the recruitment agencies also was was important. Of course, social media. Next slide, please. In terms of people to government communication, um, again the strategies were uh, the use of social media. Um, the, the the OFWs would would communicate to uh, to the government, like in the embassies, using emails, WhatsApp, um, and their uh, Facebook pages. Next slide, please. Okay, so for government to other organizations, uh, communication strategies, um, 
there were data sharing and coordination with with host countries and um and also uh, the the coordination with the recruitment agencies proved to be to be crucial so yun yung parang isa din sa naging um naging uh, important um contribution you close coordination between um the government uh, agencies in the host countries and the the recruitment agencies as well and the, the organizations of migrant workers so that's it's also um um a notable those are notable strategies for for communication next slide please Okay, so in terms of challenges, um, in our study, we also looked into the challenges in emergency repatriation that is not health related. And um, the, the purpose here was really to collect all the challenges that can hamper smooth repatriation process. So um, because we I think we might be able to use this information in the future. So based on the past repatriations um, that we've had, uh, we we got this from the the literature, um, the problems, the, the challenges uh, there that, that we experienced were the lack of data on the profile. Um, of OFWs, and um, this hampered the, the organization of OFW repatriation. Uh, for instance, numbers were mere aggregates, so there were lack of information in terms of location and gender uh, distribution. Um, the presence also of unauthorized or undocumented migrants, um, especially women um, in domestic work, also contributed uh, to the slow and costly repatriation in the, in, in the past. And also, if we look at the Middle East, where is where where the mobility of women is restricted, I think that was also one of the one of the um, the factors that hampered um, repatriation processes. Um, there were all, there were um, um, positive. Um, factors then employers from the formal uh, sectors they helped facilitate the repatriation for instance in the past like like in Libya but employers of domestic workers in for instance in Syria before were, were less supportive so so yeah these are the the, the challenges um in, in non uh, health related um, emergency repatriation now we move to the the covid 19 related challenges next slide please so um there were uh there was slow process of repatriation and i think this is uh, and sorry this is uh, due to various uh, factors not not i think this is it come from the from the literature so these are documented challenges um and um these uh factors include airport closures absence of flights restrictions to flight entry um the uncertainty about who will shoulder the cost of repatriation uh, were also was also a factor and of course the closures of embassies due to infected personnel so um some of these are are really beyond uh, the the control of of like our authorities so yeah so there were there was a slow process of repatriation and then of course, inadequate government funds. This was reported um, in, in the news. Uh, I think the FA experienced depleting funds uh, at some point. Also, OWA also reported shortage of funds. And then um, post-arrival challenges include, you know, delay delays in testing and release of medical clearance. Um, the quarantine uh, facilities being uh, overcrowded, there were also delays in arrival and the delays in arrival led to the extended stays of seafarers in dock ships. Um, of course, there was stress and anxiety as mentioned earlier. Um, we also heard about stigmatized um, returnees and poor lodging uh, conditions. So next slide please. So we also looked into how these challenges have been interrelated because we, we wanted to know um, how best to to address them uh, possibly in the future. So um, you can see, I, I really love this kind of sort of concept of mapping. Uh, whenever I, I do a study, I, I try to, to look at interconnections. So the study also featured that. Next slide, please. In terms of communication, these are also the, the challenges that we have noted. Next slide, please. Um, we have um, fragmented response. Um, I think next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So in terms of communication, we have um we have noted fragmented response. And this I think owes to the 
the multi-sectoral nature of the OFW, the, the needs of the OFWs. Um, and I think earlier uh, during the, 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 at the onset of the pandemic, there were problems in terms of data privacy and our structures uh, hindering the provision of um, the hindering the, the timely provision of assistance. Um, there was also lack of awareness on how to access assistance at first. Uh, I can only uh, understand the confusion because of the there's so many things going on. And um, the pandemic also impacted our government operations because, you know, face-to-face -face assistance, uh, there were times uh, it was limited. And then, of course, agent agency to agency coordination was also hampered due to um, where some of the personnels have been um, uh, infected also. Um, and one of the one of the challenges that have been noted in terms of the use of digital dissemination of information is that um, not all FWs are internet proficient and so um, they, they did not have access to to uh, the information because they were not proficient in in, in using uh, digital platforms, and also there was there were uh, um, issues uh, um, concerning you know fake news and, and disinformation. Now the lessons learned. Let me just um, go very uh, quickly on this one. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, in the literature, um, um, some of the good practices that have been mentioned um, included the, the, the utilization of recruitment and mining agencies in the process. Um, I think they played an important role in, in um, the, the repatriation uh, of our workers. So I think um, this, uh, this uh, aspect is something that can, can further enhance so we can engage them more actively. Um, and also the use of online and, and social media. This was noted as a, a best practice um, uh, from our experience. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the use of technology was, was instrumental in the process and hopefully this will continue you know, to be developed and enhanced um, for us to better uh, cater to the needs of migrant workers, not only in times of crisis, no, um, but also in their day-to-day -day life as migrant workers. And also the partnerships that have been built due to the mammoth task of repatriation um, uh, during the pandemic um, era. Uh, I mean, the, the networks uh, among the, the host countries, um, the Philippine government agencies and the migrant organizations. These are some of the things that, that must be uh, nurtured you know, for, for various purposes. For instance, um, in, in, in terms of facilitating uh, for example, a referral system that can help address the needs of, of OFWs. Next slide, please. So this is the last slide. Okay, so lastly, um, if we if we excel in deploying um, workers overseas, which is often mentioned in various texts that we have this um, best model for, for facilitating uh, labor migration, um, we, we have to be a good model as well for for repatriation of our workers. Um, and we learn from our experience that repatriation is not just a simple assistance of bringing people back to the country, but a system that, that relies on numerous uh, interrelated factors. Uh, for instance, we needed adequate facilities for testing or medical care. Um, the other important factors were um, the availability, the having available and unhampered, unhampered flights and entry into the, to the country. Um, functional embassies and um, or consulates, um, adequate uh, accommodation or temporary shelters. Shelters are very um, popular today because of the, the recent uh, happenings. Um, also, the importance of social protection. You know, I there are there are um, scholars who have been um, saying that perhaps it's 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 helpful to explore an insurance scheme for OFWs that cautions them in case of mandatory. Uh, repatriation or unprepared um, return to the country. And also, um, we uh, we had to have effective communication and feedback uh, platform, um, the, the one-stop shop for information dissemination and help desk with tracking. I think this is, is this important, the OASIS being um, something like that. And if we, have, if we improve on that, I think that will be uh, a more powerful um, platform for, for migrant workers in terms of, of communication and feedback. 
of course, the, the cooperation of the migrant workers and their employers um, is also was also very um, instrumental. Um, and I think it's important that we really educate them. Um, efficient system for logistics was also very uh, crucial. And also the importance of coordination of government with migrant organizations and workers affiliation, affiliation um, um, to groups that um, support migrants um, based, uh, that are based on site were also important. Uh, we also do not discard, um, by the way, uh, we, we were I wasn't able to, to um, discuss here, but uh, we do not discard the, the, broad, the importance of the broader policy operations framework that was put in place by the previous administration. So that the IATF and its subunits um, were truly a manifestation of the, the whole of government approach and, and also the quick response of the legislative branch of the government. Um, and the crucial role of the LGUs, and also um, government's uh, partnership with the private sector and other organizations, civil society groups. You know, they, it, it really brought this whole of society approach in addressing the effects um, of the pandemic. Before, um, as, as, a, as a scholar, I've been also thinking about ano ba talaga tong, how do we operationalize uh, what we call a whole of nation or whole of society. You just need to look at how the IATF worked and all its subunits and you will you will understand. So um, lastly, um, uh, I hope we hope we won't have this uh, we won't have another crisis like the COVID-19, but I think if we will, um, if we will again face a similar situation, you know, God forbid, um, I think that we will be more capable uh, to to face it if we learn from all the the lessons uh, that we we had from the from our pandemic experience, and if we enhance all our mechanisms and processes. That's the um, the end. Thank you for uh, for your attention.